Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. If you like American Catholic history, become a supporter at Locals or Patreon. We've got some great perks for supporters, including interviews, gifts, live discussions, and even items we pick up on our travels. For more, visit our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Help us keep this going. Also, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a great review at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. These help others to find us. Today, we're talking about a remarkable Irishman, the soldier, escaped convict, poet, and journalist, John Boyle O'Reilly. This guy's life is epic. He was a babe in arms in Ireland when the potato famine started. Then, after being convicted of treason, a little later after being a babe in arms, he ended up in a penal colony in Australia. After an escape that's worthy of Hollywood, he ended up in Boston, where he became one of the most respected journalists in America. He was a champion of civil rights for all at a time when this was not the norm. He helped engineer another escape from Australia, and along the way he wrote four volumes of poetry and a few other books. He was not one to let the grass grow under his feet. Ah, no. And he was one who made easy friends everywhere he went. And eventually, his mugshot from back when he was a convict ended up on a bottle of wine. Yeah, that was a pretty unexpected find. Yeah. For those curious, the labels on the 19 crimes series of wines have photos of actual British convicts on them. These convicts were all sentenced to transportation, which meant being sent to the penal colonies of Australia. The name comes from the list of 19 crimes that could result in being sentenced to transportation. One of them was if you were sentenced to death, but your sentence was commuted. This was O'Reilly's situation. O'Reilly's mug is duly featured on one of the bottles. So let's tell his story. As you said, he was born just before the potato famine over in Ireland. Yes, he was born near Drogheda on June 28th, 1844, so the year before the potato famine started. His father was a schoolmaster, and his parents were able to provide a comfortable life for him and his siblings. They survived the potato famine just fine, but they certainly knew people who did not. At 11 years old, he went to work for a newspaper man. His work was mainly as a runner and laborer. This lasted until he was 15 when he went to live with an aunt and uncle in Lancashire, England. While there, he got a job as a reporter with the local paper. He remained in England for a few years until he joined the army, being assigned to the cavalry regiment that was known as the Prince of Wales' own. Because the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII, was part of the regiment. The regiment was stationed in Ireland, so back to Ireland he went in 1863. He was an excellent soldier and a natural leader. As we said, he made easy friends everywhere. A good friend of his, Michael Davitt, wrote of him many years later, It would be impossible for O'Reilly to be anywhere on earth where human beings congregated without making friends. He was favored by his superiors and well-liked by his comrades. His ease of making friends and his natural leadership abilities caught the attention of someone else also. This was Michael Devitt. Devitt was a recruiter for the Irish Republican Brotherhood, commonly known as the Fenians. The Fenians were a revolutionary group that had violent rebellion against English rule as a core mission. They actively recruited British soldiers, and O'Reilly was happy to join. Not only did he join... But he succeeded in getting most of the 80 Irish members of his regiment to join the Fenians. Things were going fine until some of the Irishmen he was trying to recruit got cold feet and ratted him out. He and the rest of the Fenians in the regiment were arrested in February 1866. As the ringleader, he was treated more harshly and his court-martial resulted in a guilty verdict and a sentence of death. This, however, was commuted to life in prison. He spent two years in some of the most notorious and harshest prisons in England before his sentence was once again reduced to 20 years transportation. So, he'd have to spend 20 years in Australia doing hard labor. In October of 1867, he and more than 200 other criminals were loaded on the prison ship, the Hougamont, and they set sail for Australia. The prison ships were unpleasant places, the authorities weren't exactly trying to make the accommodations comfortable, and the passengers weren't exactly the most genteel of crowds. These were rough passages that took about three months. 
but O'Reilly, with his magnetic personality, made the most of it. He composed poetry, made friends with the crew and the captain, and he was given the materials to put together an onboard, handwritten, and hand-decorated newspaper. Because of course he did. He's on a prison ship, so what does he do? He produces a newspaper and writes poetry and collects stories and publishes it all for everyone to read. <laughs> oh, he was hard to keep down. He called the paper the Wild Goose after the wave of Irish fighters who fled into exile after the failed 1798 rising against English rule in Ireland. This little newspaper is a remarkable little achievement all in its own. Seven editions were produced and only one copy of each was made. The intention was for it to be passed around and read aloud to the convicts as a way to entertain, inform, and pass the time. Only one edition of The Wild Goose is still extant. It is kept in the State Library of Western Australia, and it is significant because this 1867 crossing was the final shipment of British prisoners to Australia. Transportation as a punishment for crime came to an end after this. Also significant was that England had agreed with Western Australian authorities that they would send neither political prisoners nor military prisoners. When word came that this shipment contained prisoners who were both, the people of Western Australia were not happy. But the Hougamont arrived and disembarked its controversial cargo at Bunbury, which is on the southwest corner of Australia. O'Reilly's time in Australia was about what one would expect of him. He did his work as was required, but he also became one of the more trusted among the prisoners. The warden took a liking to him and gave him courier duties. He would carry messages between the prison camp and Bunbury, and the warden even trusted O'Reilly to take messages back to his own home. One benefit to O'Reilly of this freedom was the opportunity to get to know the local parish priest, Father McCabe. O'Reilly told Father McCabe of his intention to escape, even if it just meant striking out across the Australian wilderness. Father McCabe made clear to O'Reilly that that would be a sure way to die, and likely a painful death. There are so many living things in Australia that they just want to kill you. Mm. And then the outback is just a barren desert. It's not a hospitable place. Eventually, Father McCabe agreed to help O'Reilly escape. Father McCabe arranged for an American whaling ship, the Vigilant, to pick up O'Reilly on a particular day just outside Bunbury Bay. So just before the appointed day, O'Reilly slipped away from the camp and made his way across land to a point along the coast where Father McCabe had arranged for a rowboat to be waiting for him. O'Reilly had to make a risky crossing of Bunbury Bay in that rowboat to get to where the ship would pick him up. But he made it to the Vigilant, only to be denied permission to come aboard ship. The captain got cold feet at the last minute. So with a massive manhunt afoot, O'Reilly had to hide out among the dunes on the beach for two weeks until Father McCabe arranged for another ship to take him. This time, when he rode out to meet the ship, the gazelle this time, the captain welcomed him aboard. But at the next port where the gazelle put in, the captain caught wind that British authorities were looking hard for some escaped convicts. O'Reilly included. So after departing that port, the gazelle hailed another American ship, the Sapphire, and while on the high seas, O'Reilly transferred to the Sapphire. This ship sailed to Liverpool, England, where O'Reilly managed to remain unrecognized until he could board yet another ship, the Bombay. The Bombay finally brought him across the Atlantic to America. He landed in Philadelphia on November 23rd, 1869. And thus began his American adventure. He was welcomed heartily by other Fenians who had fled to America. He gave a few lectures in Philadelphia and New York before settling in Boston as the year turned over to 1870. In Boston, in addition to being active in Irish cultural life, he took up the profession that had served him so well to date, writing and journalism. He got a job with the Boston Pilot which at the time was just a regular newspaper published by an Irishman. His first major assignment really was a spectacular one for someone with his background. He was assigned to cover the Fenian invasion of Canada. Now, for those who have never heard of this before, yes, native Irishmen living in the U.S., most of them veterans of our Civil War, invaded Canada from New York. Their goal was to establish an Irish nation on the North American continent. Since they hadn't been able to expel the English from Ireland itself, they thought the next best thing would be to take over the British-controlled territories in North America. There's actually a great book on this incredible episode called When the Irish Invaded Canada, and it recounts the absolute foolhardiness of these Irishmen and how it actually led to the establishment of Canada as a unified country within the Commonwealth. Link in the show notes. Yeah. 
Well, O'Reilly's coverage was so good that he became an editor of the pilot. At this time, he also began writing and publishing his own poetry in volumes. One effect of the failure of the Fenian invasion of Canada was the tempering of O'Reilly's zeal for Irish nationalism. He still believed Ireland itself ought to be a free and independent nation, but in America, he began to write about the importance of Americanization. Irishmen who were in America ought to accept that they were in America and stop trying to make Ireland happen here. He wrote, What are we today in the eyes of Americans? Aliens from a petty island in the Atlantic boasting of our patriotism and fraternity and showing at the same moment that deadly hatred that rankles against our brethren and fellow countrymen. But one part of his past that did not suffer alteration was his penchant for writing verse and prose. His collections of poetry included Songs from the Southern Seas and Other Poems in 1873, Songs, Legends, and Ballads, published in 1878, The Statues in the Black and Other Poems, published in 1881, and In Bohemia, which came out in 1886. His novel, Moondyne, about his life in Australia, was serialized in the pilot during 1878 and published as a one-volume book in 1879. And in 1888, his final book was a volume called The Ethics of Boxing and Manly Sport. I just love that title. (laughs) But poetry and books were not where his powerful pen really made its mark. That was in the pages of the Boston Pilot, especially after he took over its operations. Yes. In 1872, the Great Fire of Boston claimed the offices of the Pilot, and rather than rebuild, the owners of the paper put it up for sale. Finally, in 1876, four years later, the Archbishop of Boston, John Williams, bought three-quarters ownership in the, in the Pilot, with the final quarter purchased by John Boyle O'Reilly. And the motto adopted by the pilot at the time applies well to O'Reilly himself. Be just and fear not. Let all the ends thou aimst at be gods, thy countries, and truths. The pilot actually has an interesting history all its own. It was established by Bishop Benedict Fenwick, second bishop of Boston in 1829. But though it was always a Catholic newspaper, it did not become the official newspaper of the Archdiocese of Boston until 1908. But since the Catholic miscellany of Charleston which was the first diocesan newspaper in the U.S., ceased operations, the pilot holds the title of oldest continuously operating diocesan paper in the U.S. But I digress in a Boston direction. It's a good digression. You may even do an episode on the pilot one of these days. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. In the pages of the pilot, O'Reilly used his skills of writing and persuasion to rail against discrimination and injustice everywhere. Blacks, Jews, Native Americans, everyone who was downtrodden. Now, unfortunately, this was not a common approach among Irishmen at the time. Uh, No. Sadly, no. Too many Irishmen only saw blacks as competition for scarce jobs, and they allowed economic competition to color their views on race. O'Reilly, however, saw things simply. Blacks, Native Americans, Jews, they were all our fellow human persons, and they deserved to be treated as such. He gave lectures and wrote article after article excoriating racist and discriminatory practices everywhere. It seems he didn't forget the lessons learned when he was in Ireland and saw what the English did to the Irish. He was determined that such would not happen if he could help it. Naturally, he was quick to point out the injustice of anti-Irish discrimination. One tactic he used was running ads he had seen in other papers that included the line, no Irish need apply. He would run these with the implication being, if Irish need not apply for employment or the benefit being advertised, then the business in question must also be opposed to being patronized by Irishmen or businesses controlled by Irishmen. The point was made. Ah, uh, yeah. And he took this approach to bigotry and discrimination wherever he found it. He even pointedly encouraged black Americans, freed slaves especially, to find a way to be black and American, to be proud of being black Americans, to find a brotherhood within their black community while working toward being fully American. And he was happy to use his pen to aid them in this struggle. Another struggle he didn't leave behind entirely was life in the prison camp in Australia. He had escaped, and many of his Fenian compatriots had been paroled or pardoned, but a small band of Fenians remained in Australia because the British government viewed them as too militarized. Well, when the need and the opportunity presented themselves, O'Reilly was ready and willing to dive in. The opportunity came in 1874 when a letter written by one of the Fenians still in captivity was smuggled out of Australia and it reached a Fenian in New York named John Devoy. 
Devoy was an associate of O'Reilly's, and he brought the letter to O'Reilly. The two of them discussed, and, with the aid of a very few others, concocted a plan to spring most of the remaining Fenians. First, they bought a ship, the Catalpa, and they outfitted it and hired a crew for an 18-month sea voyage. Ostensibly, they were going whaling. Meantime, two Fenians traveled from America to Western Australia under false names and false pretenses. They arrived in September 1875 and spent months living out lives that befit their aliases. But all the while, they were covertly coordinating the land end of the rescue efforts. The rescue was planned for April 6, 1876, but just days before, a few British gunboats randomly arrived in Bunbury Bay. The rescuers were spooked, so they had to delay the rescue for 11 days. Finally, the day arrived and the plan went into motion. The crew on land, with the men who had snuck away from the prison camp, hopped in a small vessel and began rowing to the Catalpa, which was anchored out in international waters. A coastal police vessel randomly came out and went past the tiny vessel, but the men all ducked below and the larger boat kept going. Another police boat hailed the Catalpa and demanded to board, but was denied. That police boat didn't have enough weapons on board to force compliance, so it retreated for a while. Meantime, a fierce storm blew up and nearly capsized the small vessel carrying the fugitives and rescuers. Then when the storm subsided, that police ship, newly armed, left shore and made for the Catalpa. The smaller transport vessel saw it coming and they rowed for all they were worth. If the police vessel got to the Catalpa or to them before they got to the Catalpa, all was lost. So it was a race to the Catalpa, which the smaller vessel only barely won. The men were just scurrying to safety on board as the police ship arrived. The police demanded that the Catalpa turn over any escaped prisoners. But the Catalpa was in international waters, and once her captain raised her U.S. flag, any action taken by the police vessel would have risked an international incident. So the smaller vessel made some impotent gestures to try to intimidate the Catalpa's crew, but eventually gave up and returned to the shore. The Catalpa finally, safely, sailed out into the open waters of the Indian Ocean. The six Fenians rescued by the Catalpa arrived in New York in August of 1876 to much fanfare. Oh, what a story. I know. Hollywood can make a few movies out of O'Reilly's life, I think. Uh, yeah, it'd be better than another comic book movie or a bad remake of a beloved classic. Yeah, don't mess with my beloved classics. Seriously. John Boyle O'Reilly kept up his writing, activism, and speaking for causes of justice for all through the 1870s and 1880s. Among his friends and regular correspondents, he counted a diverse crowd, including poet Walt Whitman, prominent abolitionist Wendell Phillips, the militant Irish independence leader Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosa, and British writer Oscar Wilde. He actually hosted Wilde when Wilde was on a tour of America in 1882. His poetry isn't generally remembered among the greats, but in his day, he was well-respected, and he certainly had no problem maintaining relations with most anyone. Uh, that's true. In 1889, O'Reilly read a poem at the dedication of the National Monument to the Forefathers in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The president of the Pilgrim Society, John D. Long, introduced O'Reilly, calling him a genuine New England pilgrim because he was from a small island out at sea, and because he was at one with the genius of the pilgrim landing and of the civil and religious liberty of which it was a token. O'Reilly maintained a busy schedule and lively correspondence right up to his sudden death in 1890. He had suffered from insomnia for years, and one day in August of 1890 he was not feeling well, so he went home early. He went for a vigorous walk, hoping that physical exhaustion would help induce sleep. But just to be sure, he took a dose of his wife's sleeping medication. It was too much of a dose, unfortunately. His wife found him sitting in his chair early in the morning, alive but unconscious. She could not wake him. She called the doctor, but attempts to revive him or reverse the overdose were unsuccessful. John Boyle O'Reilly died in the morning hours of August 10, 1890, at just 46 years old. A full life well lived. His death shocked Boston, the literary community, the Irish community, and his many, many friends among blacks and other minority groups whose cause he championed. Archbishop John Williams, in reflecting on O'Reilly's pledge 14 years earlier to run the pilot, as becomes an Irishman, a Catholic, and a gentleman, affirmed he kept his word. 
At his funeral, the black lawyer and prominent politician Edwin G. Walker lamented the death of his friend, saying, As long as Mr. O'Reilly lived and spoke, we felt that we had at least, outside of our own people, one true, vigilant, brave, and self-sacrificing friend who claimed for us just what he claimed for himself. And in 1945, the official paper of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People called O'Reilly one of the best friends and strongest champions the American Negro ever had. They called O'Reilly a poet prophet of democracy, and they said that he deserved his place among our own contemporary fighters against the political and economic injustices forced upon racial minorities. Shortly after his death, his friends organized to sponsor a memorial in his honor. The memorial includes a bronze bust of O'Reilly and an allegorical group of figures which represent Erin, or Ireland, flanked by her son's patriotism and poetry. Between the bust and the group of figures is a granite wall which is inscribed with Celtic designs and a cross. The monument stands along the Fenway in Boston and was dedicated in 1896 as a permanent memorial to a man who, though larger than life in his day, is largely forgotten to history. This has been American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by the StarQuest Production Network. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter on Locals or Patreon. Get information about both and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about John Boyle O'Reilly, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. And be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History. On Instagram at ACH underscore podcast. Or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noel Hester Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest. <laughs>